you haven't been to the Sydney website have missed out on a treat of hearing him preach. He, he lives in Australia, but he's actually British. So I was telling Roberta she'd love to hear some Brit being spoken. True English. True. If she goes and, and listens to him. From, from the English, how to speak. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But um, Joe and Perry are just phenomenal, and Chris and I have known them for many years. They're best friends to us, and they're doing such an incredible job. And Joe has special experience. He's been in and out of the ministry. He's been very wealthy, working in corporate Australia, making a ton of money. He's been, you know, he, he has so much wisdom from his own life. And then, of course, it's, it's a Bible study. It's full of scripture. So hopefully you've already discovered that. And what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks is going through this. But we need you to read it first so that you can meditate, ruminate, think about. The way we learn, guys, is ask a question, answer the question, and then discuss. That's what a D group, discussion group, is about. Ask, answer, and discuss. That's the best, most effective way to learn. Students know that. You think about your classes where you, you have that type of um, atmosphere, ask, answer, discuss. You, you do better in those classes because it's how we're, we're wired to learn. So do that for yourself. Do that with your discipling partner. Do that. that. We want it to be spoken about. We want to have deeper convictions in the heart behind why and how we give. When you can get your heart right about this and you keep this conviction as a solid staple, you're going to be free and well taken care of and not stressed out for the rest of your life as a disciple. Because money, guys, is part of our daily life. And God allowed it to be that way, right? So even though it's called money is the answer to everything, and by the way, the Bible does say that in Ecclesiastes. Now we also know that Solomon said meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless, right? The end of that chapter, that book says, fear God and obey his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. And fearing God when it comes to our view on money. Fearing God when it comes to our giving, our sacrifice, our faith. It all goes back to the state of our heart. And I want you to go to Proverbs chapter, uh, Psalm chapter 24. And if I can ask Sheena to read verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 24. We're going to go through the first three chapters and I want, you to, I want you to start bringing your books to midweek, okay? Because a lot of it is sort of walking through it together. But like I said, I hopefully you've already read the first three chapters. If you haven't, that's okay. There's plenty of grace and do over. So just make that part of your quiet time on a go-forward basis here. So in uh, Psalm 24, Tina, verse um, 3 and 4. Uh, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god. And verse 5. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindic vindication from God their Savior. Wow. Guys, this is what it's about. This psalm tells us who is going to be acceptable and pleasing to God. Who is going to be able to approach God. What does it say? The four things that it says. What's the first thing that is mentioned in verse 4? Clean hands. Clean hands. Clean hands. If you've got dirty hands, you're doing something consistently and willfully that you shouldn't be doing. Are your hands clean? What's the next thing God looks for? Pure heart. Pure heart. Guys, one of my favorite scriptures is Matthew 5, verse 8. Those are the Beatitudes, the attitude you've got to be. And remember, an attitude is a thought with an emotion attached. And we choose how we think. So the B attitude is that of a pure heart. This is what's pleasing to God, guys. These are the, these are the people who are going to see God and hear those wonderful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Clean hands. Is your heart pure? Yes. Naturally, none of our hearts are pure. That's why we have, if you mess up, when you mess up, fess up. Right? That's why we have press passages like 1 John 1. How you walk in the light. The Bible even says, if you say you haven't sinned, you're a liar. 
Okay, you have sinned. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And amen as disciples, we, we make every effort not to sin, but we still mess up. And that's why we are saved by grace. But don't abuse that grace by dirtying up your heart because you're not getting open with your stinking thinking. You know what I've come to realize lately is that my doubts become my poison. Mm -hmm. And you know how you prevent that? By throwing out your doubts, putting them in the light. So who of you took my challenge and made a God ID card? Thank you, Josie. Come on, Jen. Remember we talked about who are you in God? Remember we talked about your passport, your ID, your student ID, your driver's license, right? When you want something, they're like, show me your ID, right? When you want to get in somewhere, show me your ID, right? Well, I'm going to call this my God identity. God identity. Did you get that? I thought about God port, like passport. <laughs> anyway, call it what you want. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make these periodically. I'm going to change mine from week to week as my need changes for what I need to hear from God. And so my one for this week is Psalm 4610. It says, be still and know that I am God. See, if we're not still, we cannot hear the whisper of God. And what robs my stillness is my anxiety, my doubt, my pride. Right? And uh, Mark 9, 23. Remember the dad with the boy who had the, the demonic spirit? And, the, and, and Jesus says, if I can, there are no ifs with God. Don't you love that in the message version? Anything can happen. Then the, the boy's father said, I believe. Help me with my doubts. And then I was like, I need to write out my doubts. See, that's how you personalize the scripture. You meditate on the scripture, and then you make it your own by putting your doubts, your specifics, your practical particulars out there, right? So I wrote, I'm not doing, my doubt that I'm not doing a good enough job for God in the ministry. Sometimes I wrestle with that. I'm like, God, why am I even in the ministry? Nothing's happening. You know, getting that result-oriented mentality. Sometimes I can doubt that, um, you know, if we'll get out of debt. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> what just happened? How did we get into this debt? We normally are not in debt, but we have a plan, and my husband's doing a great job, but, you know, that's a doubt. Um, I, sometimes I can doubt if the Orlando Church will do our part in building up the kingdom worldwide, the way we're being called to. That's a doubt. Sometimes I can doubt that, that um, you know, we can bring influential couples, into pillar people, into God's church here in Orlando. That's a doubt. Sometimes I can doubt that those I love the most will choose God. You know? Those are some things I, I just, I know that when you express them and you put them in the light, now you expel the power that they have over you. Yeah. It's that simple, guys. Think about how simple that is. The question is, do you talk about your doubts, your fears, specifically, practically? Put it out there, no matter how crazy your thinking is. If you put it out there, it has no power over you to grow, to poison, and to saturate, and to weaken. Okay? That's why the Bible says renew your mind. Renew it by radical openness. So I want to encourage you to get a God port all the time. Have it right here. A God identity, whatever you want to call it, to remind yourself, okay, as a tool. So, um... I love the way that Joe starts out the book by saying, first of all, the greatest commandment, right? Love God, love others as you love yourself. It always comes back to that. And then he, he says, you know, being asked, asked to give our money is not the problem. It's not what makes us struggle. It's what that exposes that's already in our heart, right? Pressure in the diamond exposes the cracks, the impurities. So whatever trial you're going through in life, when it's challenging for you, the trial has been used to expose what impurity is in your heart anyway. So we should really be grateful for the trials and the pressures that come our way. Because God's showing us, hey, you need to strengthen this area, otherwise eventually, if you don't deal with it, it will take you out. Right? I love the example of the rich young ruler, Luke 18. Right? You guys know the story of, of Luke 18, right? Who can go there for me? Penny. 
Luke 18, verse 18 through 30. And as she's turning there, what happened to this guy? Who knows the story? Was he a pretty righteous guy if you looked at him yeah. on the outside? Yeah. Yes, he was like giving 10%. He was honoring his mom and dad. He was not cursing or stealing or being, you know, immoral, so to speak. But what does Jesus ask him to do? And if you can read just the end of that where it talks about, so maybe 28 through 30. What does it say, Penny? Peter said to him, We have left all we had to, fo we have left all we had to follow you. Okay, that's where Jesus talks to his disciples. But if you back it up a little bit more. 22. Thank you. Note yourself. Bring your Bible up to the podium when you're preaching. <laughs> okay. 22? Yes. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Wow. Think about it. This is Jesus counting the cost with the rich young ruler, right? We all counted the cost to make Jesus our Lord. Every avenue of our life sold out for him. And what does Jesus call him to do? He's talking about his money, his possessions. See, and we can get so sensitive about money. No, Jesus goes right for the jugular. Why did Jesus ask him to sell everything he had? What was in his heart that was making him impure, that was connected to money? Greed. Greed. His security was in what he had, not in God. The Bible says you cannot love money and God the same. You cannot serve two, two gods, right? You have to love the one and hate the other. And that's why it was so challenging. We don't know if the rich young ruler actually repented because the Bible says he went away sad. Well, what is attributed to godly sorrow? If he did repent, and maybe he repented later, but what do we know are the attributes of godly sorrow? Repentance, Repentance eagerness, earnestness, indignation, and then joy. Act 3.19 says repentance brings refreshment. So do you see, guys? It is a real issue that can take us to hell if we don't get deep convictions about having a pure heart towards money and realizing that it's all about the heart. God wants your heart. He wants a pure heart. And, and, and when it comes to money, Satan has a hold in so many ways and can have on our hearts to poison them up, to pollute them. We want to make sure that we have deep convictions from the Bible to disinfect, to detox, to get rid of, and we know the thought patterns to go to, to line up our stinking thinking with the word and choose the truth over believing the lie. Amen. Bless you. So uh, on page 15, 16, if you do have your book, Joe talks about the history of contribution to God before the law. And this is so great because let's just back it up to the very beginning when God starts talking about money. And guess where that happens? Genesis chapter 4. In the beginning, in the very first book of the Bible, in the very beginning of the Bible, we see a scripture that talks about money, and we have Cain and Abel. Obviously, they didn't have monetary, you know, actual dollars back then, but they had their sacrifice of whatever they grew, right? So we, need, we know that Cain gave not his best, and we know that Abel gave his first fruits. And an interesting point to this, to this um, passage is that Think about it. When Adam and Eve sinned, they put fig leaves on, right? Because they were ashamed, because that's what sin does, shames you. Then, what does it say God clothed them with? Animal skins. When God gets the animal skins, maybe he showed them how to offer an animal sacrifice. You see what I'm saying? Because God had to have taught them about animal sacrifice in order for them to know to do it. So that's the whole premise behind Cain and Abel. Why Cain didn't give his best, he knew what the re requirement was. God had taught him about animal sacrifice because he had seen, he had been clothed with animal you know, skin. Yeah. But he gave the scrap. He gave what was left over. He gave what was blemished and not perfect. He didn't give his first fruit. 
And that's the whole reason God was upset. Do you see that? Let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. His own actions, his own attitudes, his own thinking and feeling about money was evil. And that led him to murdering his brother. And so he became the first murderer in the Bible. Think about Noah, right? What did Noah do after the flood? The very first thing, when he stepped out from being on the water for all of those days, Genesis 8, verse 20. Asana, can you read it? 20 and 21? Yes. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of the um, of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of, because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living, living creature as I have done. Wow, then Noah built an altar. An altar takes sacrifice. He had to take the animals that he could have sold for personal gain and give them to God. Do you see the implication here? Do you see when you're grateful? Do you see when you trust God? You give out of gratitude. You give out of all you have. You give because you're rejoicing in the Lord. You give because you're thankful. You're counting your blessings. Do you see how he was renewing his mind? He could have been on that boat terrified, anxious. When is this ever going to stop? He could have been building forests of poison in his mind. And by the time he would have got off the boat, he probably would be like, I'm never trusting God again. I'm never building another boat and I'm not getting on it. You know what I mean? He could have had a completely different attitude if he hadn't trained his mind, set his mind on things above, and trusted God and counted his blessings versus, I cannot believe I was cooped up on that, on that little boat in the tiny little cabin for X amount of days and nights. I'm seasick. I'm throwing up all the time. <laughs> do, do you see how you can turn lemons into lemonade when you have an attitude of gratitude? And that's Philippians 4, guys. Think about that. If you remember your joy comes from God alone, and you remember who God is, a hundred different names are used in the Bible to describe who God is. Do you know five of them? Yes. You should know all hundred. Because the more you know about God, guess what? The more you're going to Did you know that one of who he is is Jehovah Jireh, the great provider? So why are you anxious about money? Why are you tight-fisted when you don't do what he calls us to do when he is Jehovah Jireh? It's not what he does. It's who he is. He promises to be our provider. But we take matters into our own hands and we look at the stats and the logic behind it and we freak out because we're building poison. Instead of going, okay, this is a little scary. Admit the doubt, right? But God says, do this. So I'm going to banish the doubt and I'm going to choose obedience over fear. Do you, see, do you see the discipline that has to go on here in order to make it happen here? Yeah. Is that making sense? Isn't that an awesome example? Yeah. Go Noah. And technically, we're all descendants from Noah. <coughs> we're all one clan, see? We're actually all citizens of Jesus, but descendants from Noah. And then you see Abraham, right? On page 18, uh, Joe talks about Abraham. And in Genesis 14, we know that this Melchizedek, who they don't really describe much about, but basically, Abraham, right there, after he has this visit from this king, he says, here's a tenth of everything I have. Some people say that Melchizedek was Jesus. You know what I mean? So what in it, why did Abraham have the desire? I mean, if somebody comes to your door for a cup of tea, are you going to just give them, write a check for 10% of everything you've ever owed? I mean, that was pretty crazy, right? But we know Abraham was a righteous man. And you see the gratitude and the trust and the faith? He just, he wanted to give. 
Are you guys getting the idea? It's not compulsion. It's not you have to, you must. I'm gonna check up on you. It's, oh, I get to. Woohoo! thank you God. Gratitude, contentment, faith, trust, purity of heart. I really appreciated Chad and Raylan's communion on Sunday. I hope that really hit your heart. You know, and Chad's openness about that skepticism. Have you ever been skeptical? It's rampant in our world, you know, and so cynicism, skepticism, lack of trust, right, is really what he was talking about. Does that describe you? Have you allowed that to creep into your mentality about money towards God's church, towards what the money is being used for? The books are open. You're free to look at any book you want. That's not a sin to want to do that. But expel the cynicism, the distrust. Be like Noah. Be like Abel. Be like Abraham. Be like Jacob. Jacob appreciated God's protection. And in Genesis 28, he gave a tenth of everything he had. Do you see the pattern that, gets, that, that is being displayed here? From the very beginning, guys, this is all in Genesis. The beginning of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? So God wants your heart, sisters. He doesn't want your money. Think about it. God could direct the lottery to be won by Larcy. God can do anything, right? The lottery goes into millions of dollars. Can you imagine that? He could. But think about it. If Larcy was the only one giving out of the money that she won, what would that do for the rest of our hearts? We'd be like, eh, Larcy's going to build the kingdom. She's got it. I can get a bigger BMW. And I can get me some Gucci shoes. <laughs> anyway, you get the point, right? Um, so, again, it's not a sin to have nice things, but the, the heart, right? The heart behind it. You know, true story, when we were in the AMS region in LA, we, um, there was a guy who was converted, and, and he had a lot of money, and he did contribution one time, you know, sharing about giving, and he was super generous. And um, we, our goal was like 40,000, and we had like 20,000, and um, we had the chart, you know, the barometer, and he was like, so how much do we have so far? And we were like, 20 grand. He's like, no, 30 grand. He literally took a pile, $10,000, and put it in the plate. Oh, wow. Jesus. Yeah. There are people out there, believe it or not. I know, you know, for some of us that are like, do I have $3 to eat lunch today? It's hard to picture. But really, there's a lot of money out there, you know. But I can tell you this. By him giving so much, I, I saw at the end of that special missions, there were some who didn't give their best because they were like, oh, he'll do it. You know what I mean? So, so there was a valuable lesson in that. God wants my heart. He wants my best. He wants my sacrifice. Whether it's this big or this big, that's irrelevant. Is it my best? Does it come from a pure love, pure heart space? That's the gift that's acceptable to God. It doesn't matter how small or how big it is, guys. Be humble and examine where you're coming from in that respect. Um, so we want to honor God with our money, right? Um, we, we talked about Abraham and Jacob, and then we talked about, you know, that um, God doesn't need our money, right? He wants a willing and obedient spirit. And there's so many other great scriptures that talk about that on page 20 and 21. But then it says God... Um, God wants to give us to give acceptably, okay? He wants us to be cheerful givers. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, it says, If the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. And it begins with faith and a pure heart. God loves a willing heart, not a reluctant heart. That doesn't mean sometimes my heart won't be reluctant. We're human beings that struggle with sin. I've had a reluctant heart at times, to my shame. Now it's my responsibility to change that reluctant heart, because that's not pleasing to God, to repent and choose willingness over reluctance. Choose healthy, happy trees in my brain over poisonous toxins. Do you see how simple it is, guys? 
Because sometimes we might think, well, I'm not willing today. I'm not a cheerful giver. So guess what? I ain't giving nothing. You have the freedom to say that and to be that and to do that. But guess what? You're in a bad place with God, guys. And he doesn't need your five dollars. He wants your heart. He wants your heart. The gift is acceptable when the willingness is there. I love the way on page 24, Joe talked about some real reasons and some real excuses that we've made, and I've made some of these, as to why I haven't given. And that's on page 24. He talks about, I feel hurt by someone. Sometimes we feel hurt by someone in the church, and we're like, I ain't giving my money. How does that make sense, right? Then we could maybe say, I feel like it is the church, not God, asking for the money. Right? Anybody ever thought that? I don't feel like I was listened to or consulted on the amount needed, so I'm not going to agree with the amount. Have you ever felt that way? Um, I don't trust people, especially a few of the leaders in my local church, so I'm not giving. Um, I do not trust, uh, okay, so then he says, you know, I will, I will give a good amount so that nobody challenges me, but I'm not going to give what I know I could. You know, so it's that minimal, minimalistic attitude, you know. Um, another excuse could be, I cannot afford to give. Uh, my non-Christian family needs the money more than God's church. I'm thinking about leaving the church, so I'm not going to give. Uh, I overspent this week, so God, too bad for you. I enjoyed that. Uh, Gucci shoes. <laughs> Gucci shoes. Um, I think I'm losing my job, so, oh, sorry for you. Sorry, God. You aren't getting anything. Um, another excuse could be more doctrinal, like, I prefer to give to the poor. Well, just to let you know, your benevolence goes to the poor. Part of our giving on Sunday, a percentage of that goes to support the orphanage that our church runs in Cambodia. You are supporting orphans in Cambodia. You are supporting the poor. But if we pull it together and then let it be distributed that way, we're going to be way more effective than you off on your lonesome giving to whoever you think. Do you see the unity issue and the working together issue? Yeah. Um, I already give a tithe and I'm not giving one penny more. Tithing was Old Testament. In the New Testament, we're called to be generous, right? God does not care if I withhold my money, and it won't affect me. Another excuse would be, I will give to God if I can afford it after I've paid all my bills. I'll give God the scraps, if I have any. I need to see how, you know, my finances work out before I'm ready to give to God. So, you know, these and many more are excuses. But guys, in the book, there are scriptures that refute every one of these excuses. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's all they are. Lack of faith, lack of love, lack of purity of heart, and sitting in your feelings. Mostly associated with faithlessness, greed, distrust. All of which are sins. Right? Yeah. Um, so in summary, the first chapter really talks about um, the heart. God wants the purity of your heart. This is seen in the examples in the Old Testament. God is interested in our hearts. He only wants a kingdom of people with willing hearts. I love the scripture in Isaiah 1, 18. It says, if you're willing and obedient, you will be the good of the land. And if you resist and rebel, what's going to happen to you? <laughs> Devoured by the soul. And we're talking hell. The hot spot forever, right? <laughs> and who remembers the definition of eternity that I gave you guys on Saturday? Oh, the sparrow in your stone of each, one grain? Yes, okay? So where do you want to be for eternity? Okay, eternity is too long to be wrong, right? Uh, by the way, it's my husband's birthday today. 57. <laughs> And then, you know, when we really look at the excuses we use not to give our wealth, we see God has a solution for every excuse or every problem. The challenge for us 
is to make sure our heart is pure and right before God when it comes to money. That's the real challenge. Yeah. Okay? And you have control over that because God says to you, I lay before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose. Renew your mind. Cut those poisons. And be the way God wants you to be. Right? Yeah. Chapter 2 talks about being rich. Guys, do you know that subliminal messages, especially in media, social media, music, I'm going to be a millionaire. Right? <laughs> okay? The subliminal message is if you're not a billionaire by the age of 17 because you're a YouTuber, then you're a loser. Okay? That is a lie from the devil. That is a lie from the devil. Look at what it says here in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Do you know that Jesus never had a home? He never had a car, or a wagon, or an ox, or a donkey. He only borrowed one. Do you know that he died with a loincloth? That's your Savior. That's your Lord. That's our role model. He died with a loincloth because he wanted to save us. What is your view on getting rich? Why would you want to choose richness, which the Bible teaches is the harder path into heaven? Okay, let's go to the scripture right here in um, Luke 18, verse 24. It says, Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that crazy? The world says get rich. God says be poor. Okay, and of course poverty is relative. God says our needs will be met. But you, you understand what the Bible is teaching here, right? Yeah. In Luke 6, 24, it says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Isn't that crazy that we think rich, richness is the goal? And that's what America preaches, guys. America is based on greed, the way our country runs. What is credit? Credit is buy now, pay later. That's greed. Technically, if you don't have the money to buy it, you should say, no to the purchase and save up your money and count the costs and be wise and get advice and then buy it when you have all the money to give. Right? Do you see how backwards that thinking is? That if you don't have 15 credit cards in your wallet, there's something wrong with you. Right? And it's an easy trap to get into. Believe me. We're working through one of those right now. But you see how God wants us to be content with what we have. Be content with what you have. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. What is your salvation worth? What is your salvation worth? Could you put a monetary value on your salvation? What are you willing to pay to be saved? Really, if you want to put it that way, evaluate what that would be worth. Eternity. Remember the sparrow. Okay? Where do you want to be? Blessed are the poor. This is Jesus' perspective. In, in, um, in Mark, uh, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, the Bible says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That attitude of, I'm nothing without God. God is my everything. Is God enough for you? Right? Uh, we are to be rich in faith. We are to be rich in generosity. These are the things that are valuable to God. The Bible preaches that there's freedom in poverty. Proverbs 13, verse 8. We're on third, page 31 of the book. It says, a woman's riches may ransom her life, but a poor woman hears no threat. Think about it. Who gets um, kidnapped? Yeah. Not poor people. <laughs> The Bible 
creature is that they're dangerous to wealth, right? Wealth is deceitful. Proverbs 23, 4 through 5. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. How many people do you know that work two and three and four jobs? Not because they have to, because they want to keep up with the Jones next door, right? The Bible says, do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cost but a gl glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off in the sky like an eagle. <laughs> yes, that is true. When we were in the recession of 2008, and we were out of the ministry, and we owned three houses, and we had a lot of equity, and we had a business, and then the market crashed, and Chris goes, there was the stork flying away with our satchel of money, and he had a big cigar in his mouth, and he was like, <laughs> We've never been hungry and we've never been homeless. God takes care of us. And when we look back at that time, Chris and I thank God for that time. Because even though we thank God for the, you know, houses and the business and the equity, we had over a million dollars in equity. But you know what? Slowly your faith starts to slip into your equity. Your confidence starts to slip into the equity, even though you're thanking God for it. And I believe with all my heart, that's why God took it away from us. And I'm so grateful that he did. I'm so grateful that he did. Wealth is deceitful, guys. Make no mistake. Money does not make you happy. That's another lie in America. The more you have, the happier you'll be. Okay, those of us who had the privilege to travel to third world countries, who's been out of the country to a third world country? What do you know? The Bible is true, guys. 
And if you've been around for any amount of time, you probably know somebody who's left and maybe they have more money. But let me tell you this, they don't have more peace. They don't have more joy. They don't have more fruitfulness. They don't have more love, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, or self-control. Yeah. That's out of the window. Those are the fruits of the Spirit that really are worth something. Right? So don't forget that wealth can lead you away from God and away from the mission being your treasure. Love God and hate money. That's what Jesus teaches about money. Matthew 6, 24. No servant can serve two masters. She will either hate the one and love the other, or she'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's eyes. Yeah. Who are the stars? Who, the, who are the celebrities? Who are the famous people? Yeah. The rich. The beautiful in the world's eyes. Right? That's highly esteemed in the world's eyes. Who has power? Those who have money. You see what I'm saying? So subconsciously, we're like, ooh, I want money. I want, you know what I mean? We can go there. When we forget the true treasure, true peace, true value, true worth comes from a pure heart that loves God with every fiber of your being. Those are the women who God is going to value and esteem and take to heaven and protect while we're here on this, pla on this planet. God has your back, sisters. I've been giving special missions for 25 years, and I am so grateful for the privilege. I've sold my wedding ring to give to special missions. Chris and I have sold a car to give to special missions. We've taken money out of our IRA to give to special missions because we are committed to meeting the need. I'm so grateful for my husband, you know, he made the plan that we're going to give an extra $50 each, which is an extra $100 every week towards our special goal, so we can be giving a thousand each by May 19th. And you know that today, the loan officer who, who did our loan for our house, he called us and he was like, hey, there's a really special opportunity for veterans and he, he, he's saying, and again, we have to look into this, but Chris was like, Wow, we just made this decision, and now God is maybe lowering our interest rate by half a point. That's a big deal on the purchase of a house. You know what I mean? And he's like, oh, you could save like $100 a month. We're like, really? Go God. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I, 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 sub, I teach aqua aerobics sometimes at 25 Fitness. And I just do it because you get free membership, and that's what I like. <laughs> I also do it to reach out to people. But... They've been calling me more and more. I mean, not like every day, but like once a week or, you know what I mean? And that's 25 bucks. I'm like, go God, special <laughs> missions. Okay, so guys, there are opportunities. God will bring them to you. But you've got to step out on faith with a pure heart. Get rid of that fear. I'm so grateful for Janice. Yesterday we had an awesome discipling time. And she was sharing with me that scripture in 1 Peter chapter, 1 John 4, where it says, perfect love drives out fear. And she was saying that any time she has fear, any kind of intimidation or some kind of fear that I won't have one, that she cannot operate in perfect love when there's any level of fear. And the solution to that is communication, openness. You know what I mean? And she was just sharing how she was sort of intimidated by somebody and she knew she couldn't love them in a perfect way because there was a fear. And so she used the analogy of the movie, Who's Seen Little, Little Foot? It's an animated movie. Yeah. Thank you, Tina. See, she's seen what's good to see. That's right. It's an animated movie, and it's called Little Foot. And, and, and Janice was sharing, you guys should see it. So Janice was sharing that there's a message, a spiritual message behind this movie, because it's about the big foot, right? The big white monster, and the little foot. The little white monster. And the whole moral of the movie is because they didn't communicate, they couldn't get along. 
There was not a city to understand Bigfoot versus Littlefoot to be able to get in each other's shoes or feet and so have love and compassion for each other. And what a great lesson that is, right? Drive out the fear, guys, or you'll never be able to perfectly love God yeah. with your heart, with your time, with your schedule, with your money, with your talents. Yeah. You won't do it. Drive out the fear. Okay, is this making sense? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to stop now because it's 9.02. So, um, guys, this is just a little taste of what the book is full of incredible teaching from the Bible to help our heart. So please take it seriously. If you still haven't bought one, they're on Amazon for 20 bucks. Please get one, or at least borrow your roommates if she'll let you while you get one. But please be urgent to get it, not only get it and sit on the shelf and collect dust. No. Now open and read the Bible. There's a lot of scriptures that are actually written, but there's some references. Go to those scriptures too. The more truth you can flush through your mind and through your brain, the more you're going to be building these wonderful, deep convictions that are going to purify your heart. You'll have the tools so that as you go, one day at a time, you can renew the world that tries to saturate and seep in and rob us of that willing, obedient, trusting attitude.